hi everyone good morning good afternoon good evening depending upon when you are watching this lecture my name is Salman Ahmed I'm a PhD student in professor Daphne Ears group so in this lecture I'll be giving you some overview about code reuse attacks some of its example especially focusing on return oriented programming then some of the defenses like address space layout randomization or ASLR and control flow integrity like CFI. So this is the outline of this lecture. So first I will give you some overview about existing attacks and the defense that prevent those attacks. Then I'll be talking about the code reuse technique and the classes of code reuse attacks like return oriented programming or ROP, jump oriented programming or JOP and so on. Then I'll be talking about the address space layout randomization and how address space layout randomization or ASLR makes code reuse attacks difficult. And finally, I'll, I'll be talking about control flow integrity, which is another defense and how the control flow integrity or CFI protects all control oriented attacks. Also, I'll be talking about how one can implement CFI and what are the key challenges to implement a perfect CFI defense solution. So in your assignment of buffer overflow exploit, you basically turn off all the mitigation in your task two. So when this is the case, that means when there is no mitigation, attackers can inject a shell code in the stack and override the return address to point out to that shell code. To prevent these types of attack, uh, de uh, defenders introduce the stack canary defense. So when the stack canary is enabled in your system, you cannot simply override the return address because th then there will be a mismatch between where the code gets called and where it returns. To circumvent these attackers, uh, introduce another kind of attack so instead of overwriting the uh, return address attackers override the standard exception handler by pointing out the handler to the attackers injected shell code so when a program uh, causes an exception it the shell code gets it, uh, executed in order to prevent this standard exception handler override uh, defenders introduce uh, standard exception handler override protection or SCASOP. Now to circumvent this attacker introduce an, uh, another technique called fake SCA chain. Then the defenders think thought a little bit broadly and introduce the NX or no execute and or DEP and uh, also uh, in other name data execution prevention to prevent uh, any shell code that is stored in writable location in order to in, in order to avoid the execution so basically the nx or dep prohibits the execution of shell code that is stored in in a writable uh, section of a memory like stack heap or some other writable section like data segment now to circumvent this uh, NX or DEP, attackers use code reuse attack. Then defenders introduce the address space layout randomization in order to make the code reuse attack difficult. Then attackers uh, like follows a different path like the GOT override. So GOT stands for global offset table. So basically if a program, if a program calls some library functions, uh, it goes through the God table. So God table stores all the address to some external function calls. For example, if you would like to call the printf from your program, the printf is part of the libc library. So the God table will have an entry with an address of the printf. Now, if attackers can somehow overwrite uh, the address of printf with the address of their shell code, then when the program invokes the printf function the shell code gets executed now now in order to prevent that defenders introduced rel relative read only or rel row which is basically uh, protect overwriting any got entries 
now another thing is uh, whenever we talk about aslr initially it was aslr with non pie so pie stands for pos uh, position independent executable so basically uh, the aslr randomize all the modules like uh, stack heap memory map any linked libraries based on this of, of all of these modules but it does not uh, it didn't uh, randomize the main executable so then the PIE was introduced which is basically in addition to randomize all the modules like heap stack memory map linked libraries it also randomized the the main executable like the main executive executive executable can have text segment data segment got segment bss segment so then all of these sections are also randomized when aslr with pie option is introduced now when somebody has stack canary nx sch op aslr with pi and railroad enabled in their system then attacks become then it becomes very difficult for attackers to make reliable exploit in addition to that attackers also need a new class of vulnerability called memory disclosure vulnerability to make to proceed with an attack now in order to make this information leak uh, invalidate attack uh, defenders introduce leakage re resilient solution so basically even if your program uh, leaks some information attackers cannot use those information in useful way and another class of uh, defense is control flow integrity or cfi which is orthogonal to all of the leakage resilient solution and all of the uh, mitigation techniques described here. So CFI alone can get all the control oriented, can detect all the control oriented attacks. So basically the CFI detects any deviation from the normal flow of a program. For example, in your buffer overflow assignment, you override your return address by pointing it to a shell code so when execution comes to that point uh, your programs flow jump into that shell code which is a deviation from the normal uh, flow of that program and cfi can detect that deviation so this is how cfi works but i'll talk more about cfi with examples in the following slides okay let's get back to the code reuse attack so in your buffer overflow assignment, uh, you overwrite the return address by pointing it to your injected shell code. Now when the con control flow of the program uh, gets into this point, it will jump to that shell code and sh the shell code will is gets executed. Now when you have the NX or DEP defense enabled, you cannot simply execute your injected shell code because stack is already writable so it, it is it is not executable now in order to circumvent this what attacker does is they use some existing code from the application address space so basically when you disassemble your binary you will have different sections such as data sections uh, bss section text section uh, heap section all of this so Basically, the text section or text segment contains all the code that developers write for an, applic for an application. So what uh, attackers does is uh, they utilize the code from the text segment of an application. So basically, they are reusing the existing code. Now, this reuse of existing code is not arbitrary. So the attackers use it in some particular format for example they use it in in the form of whole functions like system exit or they can use it in form of gadgets so gadget is uh, like uh, cpu instruction sequences usually uh, end by a written instruction or a jump instruction or a call instruction so this gadget can do like some specific operations but i'll talk more about in the following slides so the idea is so the idea is attackers use the existing code from an application's address space in form of whole functions or in form of gadgets 
So as you have already seen the return to libc where the attack technique uh, utilized like uh, the whole function such as system or like bin bash all these things which is come from some existing source code. So this is called the return to libc and the libc part comes here because the libc is a huge library and is known to have like all sort of functions that attackers may need and it also proven that attackers can find like Turing complete operations from libc library. So another form of whole function uses is this counterfeit object oriented programming. So this technique utilizes the C++ partial functions. So they can chain these partial functions together to construct the shell code. Now in form of using the gadgets, there are three widely popular techniques, which is return oriented programming or ROP, jump oriented programming or JOP and call oriented programming or COP. So the return oriented programming or ROP technique actually uses short instruction sequences that end with a return instruction. This is smaller uh, uh, set of instruction called gadget and it can do some specific operation. Now when you replace this return like the last instruction with uh, jump then it called jump oriented programming. If you replace the last instruction with call then it called call oriented programming. So these are the three deepnet techniques that attackers usually use to construct their shell code. Now attackers can utilize the three techniques together to construct a shell code. And the most widely and useful attack technique is this return oriented programming or ROP attack techniques. Okay, so as I said before, gadgets are short instruction sequences. They usually do some specific purpose and for return oriented programming or ROP gadgets, they are end with a return instruction. Now the, this, uh, uh, gadgets can do some specific operations like addition subtraction then loading some values from memory storing some values to memory all sort of operations so these rop gadgets are known to have like during complete operations uh, by you can find all the necessary gadgets to do it do during complete operations now when you, you have this operation, you can chain them together to achieve some, some goal, usually some malicious goal. So in the next slide, I'll talk about how attackers can utilize these ROP gadgets to construct like a malicious goal, for example, to get a shell. So uh, before uh, like going, jumping into the gadget part, I just want to set up the environment here. So our goal is similar to what you have done your buffer overflow assignment. Like we would like to launch a shell like the shell we got by exploiting a stack buffer overflow vulnerability in your last assignment. Now the threat model is different here. So in your last assignment, you had the NX or DAP wa was turned off. Now in this case, the NX or DAP is turned on. In your assignment for task two, you had the ASLR turned off, but now the ASLR is turned on. And you also had a buffer overflow vulnerability in your stack program of the BOF function. So we will also have a, a buffer overflow vulnerability in this case, but in addition to that, we will also need a memory disclosure vulnerability. This memory disclosure vulnerability is necessary in order to circumvent the address space layout randomization or ASLR. Okay, now get back to the shell part. In order to get a shell in high level language like C, if we just execute this XGCBE function with, a, with the first parameter pointing to some string like slash bin slash SAs, when this uh, execv function gets execute with this parameter we get a shell on in in the style in the form of child process on top of a par parent process now this is high level thing what it does in the low level is is invoke a system called gadget which is int 0x80 but it needs some particular setup for example it need 
the ex register to have 0xb or the number 11 in decimal which is the system call number of excv so we need EA, eax register to have 0xb ebx register to point to, ebx register to point to some uh, memory where this slash bin slash ssh is stored then and ecx and edx register to point some null bytes so idea is the idea is similar you will overwrite the return address to invoke this system call gadget with the necessary parameters that needed for this invocation now the tricky part here is how we can set this ex ebx ecx and edx registers so that part uh, we can do using uh, the rop gadgets okay now in order to store a fixed value that can be fit in a 32-bit register uh, we can do it pretty straightforwardly for example if we would like to store 0xb value in eax register we can simply do it like we can just move this value to this ex register but if we if we would like to uh, store this slash bin slash slash ssh value to some register we cannot simply do that because this string is already 8 bytes so we cannot store this 8 bytes value in 4 bytes register or in other words 32 bit register and also this string is null terminated so we, ca we cannot store the null bytes in register so this uh, another thing here you can you see the slash bin slash slash ssh we add an extra slash in order to make it 8 bytes previously it was 7 bytes so when, when we add this extra slash here it makes it 8 bytes that solves the problem of alignment issue but semantically if we add an extra slash here it's okay in order to circumvent the issue of storing this long string in register what one can do is one can look for this string in the existing address space of an application and simply can point ebx register to that address but if the address space or the binary does not have this string then one needs to write this string somewhere in the memory first then point this ebx register to that location so in our case we assume that the application does not have this string so we will uh, or like copy this string somewhere in the memory and then point our abx register to that location and finally we need to point the ecx and edx register to some null bytes now we cannot simply copy the null bytes into the stack there, there are some issue with the copying but what we can do we can look for null bytes in the existing writable segments of, of a memory for example in our case we look we look some null bytes in the data segment of the binary and particularly we're starting from this address 0804A010 so we have a set of null bytes here so what our goal is we will copy the slash bin here slash ss slash slash sh here and then we'll have already there some null bytes so we can then point our ecx and edx register to to these null bytes now how can we achieve this copy and store part and pointing our register to those addresses the process is simple let me go through the illustration process okay so the process start with overwriting a return address so in this case uh, we'll overwrite the return address with an address of some gadget so in this uh, illustration i have we for in this illustration or in this exploit we need three kinds of gadgets one is pop gadgets another name is load register uh, one is uh, store gadget another name is write hotware another is the system call gadgets so the uh, pop gadget or the load register gadget and this store gadget are rop gadgets and this int 0x80 is system gadgets okay so when our execution come to this point since we have overwritten the return address with this uh, this gadget it will go 
it will execute this gadget now this gadget is a pop gadget what it does it pop the next element from the stack and set as a value of which register used in this instruction pop instruction of or this pop gadget so when this a uh, gadget gets executed uh, it will pop the next value from the stack which is 0804 a0 on 0 and set as a value of edx so edx will have that particular value now the execution comes to this point and this is the address of this pop gadget now this pop gadget has pop eax so it will pop the next element from the stack and set as a value of eax so once this gets executed we'll have eax as a value of slash bin okay now we have ex at the value of ex is slash bin and edx is 0804 a0 on 0 and the execution comes to this point which is the address of this particular gadget now this gadget is is right what where so basically this what this gadget does is it takes whatever value this ex register has and write that value to some memory location pointed by this edx register now in our case this edx register has value 0804 a0 on 0 and ex register slash bin so it will copy that particular address that particular value to some memory location starting from this address and store this value there so this address is pointing to this location in our case so when this particular gadget gets executed will have slash bin as a value of for this particular memory uh, memory like slot now we, we can simply repeat this process to copy the slash slash SSAs I simply clip that part in order to save some space in here so if you just repeat this process we'll get slash slash SSAs here okay now get back to our register setup so we had planned to set evx register to set with some address that has this uh, string terminated with some null bytes so if you look here we have an address which has this slash bin slash ssas and null bin terminated by this null bytes so you can simply set this value as the value of ebx how we can do that we can again use the pop gadget so in this case pop ebx so we will which will pop the next value from the stack and set as a value of evx now we have set the next value as this address so when this uh, gadget executed we'll have ebx as the value of this address similarly we can set ecx and edx uh, by setting this uh, value as this value which is the address of a null byte so we can use the pop ecx which will pop the next element from the stack and set as a value of ecx so on this gadget gets executed we'll have CX, ecx as a value of this value similarly we can set the edx register so simply use the pop gadget it will pop the next element from the stack and set as a value as edx so we'll have edx with this value and finally we will we use another pop gadget which is pop eax so it will pop the next value from the stack and the next value is 0xb which is this value so it will pop this value from the stack and set as a value of eax register so if if this instruction gets executed we'll have eax with this value now look at this register we have all the necessary values in our registers now we can simply uh, execute this system call gadget which is int 0x80 so once we execute this uh, system call gadget we'll get a shell okay so now the question is how can we get all these uh, gadget information address of these gadgets this system called gadgets and how can we look for this data segment thing uh, i'll show everything in a live demo 
and how can you look for these gadgets using some tools I will also cover that part as well in the live demo part okay so this demo part will cover three things first how ASLR randomizes different uh, base address of segments and modules the second thing is uh, how you can look for a different gadgets that we need for an ROP based exploit and the third thing is I will go through uh, a ROP based exploit and run that exploit to get a shell okay so the first thing is how SLR randomize randomizes different base address of segments and modules so in order to show that I have a simple program called shell so if I open the shell program in GDV if I make a breakpoint at main and if I set this set if I issue this set disable randomization of command then it will turn on the ASLR for GDV because by default GDV set the randomization off so in order to make it on we have to disable of this randomization so the command is set disable randomization off if you set if you issue the command set disable randomization on that will actually turn off the ASLR for GDV okay so if, if I just run uh, the program it will execute and it will uh, stop at the main now if you issue the info files command that will give you all the segments of the linked library as well as all the segments of this main executable like the shell program so these are all the uh, segments that this shell program has so like for example we have showed it every binary has like the text segment uh, the god segment bss segment uh, data segment all these segments now let's copy this line to store somewhere we'll run this program again to see if this text segment start from another different address or not so in order to do that uh, let's copy this text this line here so this is basically meaning that this text segment is starting from this address for this run okay now you can issue another command which is info proc mapping to see the starting address of the stack like in this case they start starting from this address so copy this line somewhere in this file and you can also see the heap is starting from this address so let's copy that line somewhere in this file okay now we uh, continue with this program to make it finish so this program will uh, uh, like give a shell because this is a simple call shell function like the one you have have had in your assignment so we just uh, exit from the shell and we rerun this program again now we will issue the info pro map info files command again to see all the linked libraries as well as all the segments of the shell program so now in this in this case let's copy this line and put it right below the previous run so the first run the take segment is started from this address the second run take segment is started from this address and now you can see that uh, these two addresses is not same because this is starting from 370 and this is starting from 9b0 so this is different now let's look into the uh, heap and stack so in this in this second run uh, the stack started from this address and which is different from the first first run and also for the heap also for the if the if it started from this address in the previous run is it is it started from this address like uh, e300 now it is started from 8b000 
so you see and the aslr randomizes the base address of all this text segment or this stack or heap module different address from in different runs so this is how aslr uh, randomizes the base address of different segments or different modules okay so exit this now the second thing i would like to show you about how you can look for different gadgets that we have shown uh, in in the illustration of uh, illustration of our exploit in in previous slides so basically you can use some existing tools for finding our, like rop gadgets so you can search for rob gadget tool so this is a tool for searching the rob gadget so you can install it in your machine like you have to just install this uh, prerequisite capstone library then you can just install it from issuing this command so there are a bunch of other tools as well like ropper so you can search for ropper which uh, is also like the purpose is same but it's a different tool it also can help you searching the rob gadget so there is another tool called rob me which is also like uh, does the same thing so there are a bunch of uh, this kind of gadget finder tools so you can use whatever which one you would like to use so in this case i have already installed this rob gadget tool so let's see how we can use the drop gadget tool so for rob gadget tool we just need to uh, input a binary file so in this case we will input this is our uh, binary file like the vulnerable binary file which is which we usually call the challenge binary so this is the binary that we are going to input in the rob gadget tool so to input the binary you just need to write dash dash binary then the name of the or path of the binary so if you if you then hit the enter it will give you all the gadgets that are available in that binary so you can look for like all the gadgets that you need for example in our case we needed this store gadget remember this was the store gadget that we used like we set ex with some value then we copied and stored that value somewhere pointed by this edx register then also needed a bunch of like pop gadgets like for example this pop ex then pop ebx then pop ecx all this gadget we needed so we uh, we, we look into this uh, by gadget set then we just take which one we needed and we just copied this address so this is how we can like look for gadgets and this is the responsibility of the attackers to send them together but there are also some tools that can automatically change these gadgets to do some malicious purpose like you have to define what kind of goal you would like to achieve then according to that those kind of gadget chaining tool can chain gadgets for you but those tools are not very precise okay so this is how you can uh, get your gadgets now the next thing i'll go through uh, the an exploit and i'll run that exploit to get a shell so basically i have collected all the gadgets and i just put down the address of those gadgets like pop ex pop ebx the move gadget which is basically the stored gadget where i have the address of it and i also have the address of the writable memory and some other like uh, padding and simple text so this address function here convert a, a, a input gas input address into little endian form so remember in your buffer overflow assignment you uh, like change the address into the little endian form before overwriting the written address so this is so this address function is doing that then in this case our uh, vulnerable binary is the challenge binary and it has a buffer of length 76 so i just padded the buffer with some text from here and some padding using this x and the next thing is i override the ebp point ebp register 
then the next thing is I overwrite the return address with the address of this uh, pub gadget so remember in our illustration we re overwrite the return address to the to the address of this pub gadget then we put the writable memory just after it so that whenever this pub gadget execute it can execute the next element from the stack and set as a value of this edx register then we used the pop ex gadget so this is the address of the pop ex gadget and we put the slash bin here so uh, this pop ex gadget will pop the next element from the stack which is slash bin and set as a value of ex then we use this uh, right hot where is basically this store gadget address so when we when we execute this uh, gadget it, it will copy this bin to and store this value to some memory location pointed by this writable memory so this is the address basically this address in our illustration we showed the showed that this is pointing to somewhere in the data segment so basically this portion of code responsible for uh, storing slash bin to some writable memory locks which is basically the data segment in our case and store it there and we skip this part like copying slash slash sh part but this is exactly the same thing except we have to increment the uh, writable memory location by four in order to select the next slot of the of the data segment so we just added four to this writable memory location and change slash bin to slash slash sh so this will copy the slash slash sh to to this writable memory lock memory plus four location okay so the next thing we talk about setting up all the uh, re register like ebx register we need to set it to some memory location where slash bin slash slash ssh is located so this is the uh, pop uh, the address of the pop ebx and the next element is that writable memory location address and similarly we set ecx and edx to that uh, null bytes location this is so this is the memory writable memory plus eight so writable memory plus four is the address of slash slash ssh sh and the writable memory plus eight is the address of the null bytes so we set the ecx and edx register with the address of the null bytes then finally we set the register ex with value 0 xb so this is basically the number system call number 11 in order to uh, like invoke the exe cv system call and finally we have the address of the system call gadget which is int 0 x 80 and we print this buffer so what we will do we will first uh, like generate an exploit payload by issuing python exploit.pi and then get like piping the output like in our exploit program we have in our exploit program we have this print statement so this will print the output to this exploit file so if you put that we have like this exploit file so if you we get that exploit so basically it's uh, some random text and and the payload now if we issue this command which is basically uh, issue a cat exploit command which will print the the exploit and pipe that exploit print out to this as an input to this dot challenge program which is the vulnerable program so once we hit enter it will give us a shell say if you can just issue the ls command the id command or whatever like the uname command and you can just exit using the exit command so this is how you can use the rop based exploit to get a shell so please feel free to uh, like ask any questions if you cannot follow some part I'd be happy to answer that those questions.
Okay, let's get back to the address space layout randomization or ASLR defense. So from the exploit demo, we have seen that the address of a single gadget can be different in different runs. This is because the address space layout randomization relocates each of the segment and module in a different location by randomizing the base address of those segments or modules. Uh, this is why uh, exploit can be run can be executed successfully in on run of an application but may not be successfully executed in another run of the same application so this is how the address space layout randomization uh, make the code reuse attack difficult now how the address space layout randomization works so as we have already discussed an application address space can have like different segments and modules for example the text segment the heap module stack module the got segments data segments and also can have the linked libraries now the address space layout randomization also known as the coarse grain address space layout randomization or slr randomizes the base address of each of these segments or modules like this for example here in on run of this application the text segment start from this address but in another run the text segment can be started from a completely different address and in another run the text segment can be started from completely another different address so the idea is to randomize the base address of each of these segments or modules in different runs however the internal layout of each of these segments or modules remain unchanged so the no execute or nx and aslr are the most widely used and deployed uh, defense mechanism mechanism in modern system so basically in all modern operating system the nx and the aslr are enabled by default so what are the good things and the bad things of aslr or also the coarse grained aslr the good thing is it can prevent many code reuse attacks where the memory disclosure is not possible remember for our attack setup we had uh, had assumed that in addition to the buffer overflow vulnerability we assume there is also a memory disclosure vulnerability now in many attacks same vulnerability can serve both purposes but in in many cases we need two different vulnerabilities now the the mm, bad thing is that this address space layout randomization or aslr or coarse grain aslr is vulnerable to brute force attacks in your assignment in task 4 you ha you had run a script which basically give you a lots of segmentation fault and until at some point you get shell that means the brute force attacks worked there so this kind of brute force attacks are particularly applicable for some server applications where uh, the server application gets uh, restarted whenever they get crashed so uh, the attackers can repeatedly try their exploit but if the server system have like other mechanism to detect this uh, repetitive uh, vulnerable or uh, malicious action then they can block the repetitive execution of, of uh, the attacks and also vulnerable to memory disclosure vulnerability so basically the memory disclosure vulnerability of this vulnerability allows attackers to know the address space of an application in this coarse screen aslr uh, leaking a single address or address of a single gadget can lead us to reveal all the other gadgets for example in our case if we can somehow leak the address of this move gadget we can uh, get all the other address of all the other gadgets that we need so what are the solution to this memory disclosure problems 
So first of all, we have to write CQ code so that the memory leakage is not possible. But this is almost impossible for C, C++ language because these languages allow uh, program, programmers to manage their memory by them, themselves. And programmers, programmers always make mistakes. The second thing is the leakage resilient defenses. So for ASLR, it would be fine-grained ASLR. We'll be talking more about this fine-grained ASLR in the next slide. But the purpose of this re leakage resilient defense is to invalidate any uh, memory leak. Okay, so what is the, the fine-grained ASLR? So basically in coarse-grained ASLR, we have seen that uh, the coarse-grained ASLR randomizes only the base address of a modules or a segments, but the internal layout remain unsensed. So the fine-grained address space layout randomization or ASLR uh, in addition to doing randomizing the base address of any segments or modules, it also restructures the internal layout of those segments or modules. For example, in this case, we have this text segment starting from this address in run one. So in run two, when we apply the re relocation of each modules, the text segment can start from this address, which is different from this. Now this is the coarse grain ASLR. Now the internal layout of this text segment, for example, this text segment can have multiple functions. So the internal layout, like all these functions, can also be randomized in fine-grained ASLR. Now I have only shown this for this text segment, but for other segments like GOT, which is basically has like lots of entries so they can randomize all these entries and for data segment they can randomize all the global variables and for a stack they can uh, like randomize the stack frames so there are different ways on can achieve this fine-grained ASLR and for this particular case we have also shown and uh, the granularity up to this function level but the, a function can have basic blocks, a basic blocks can have different instructions and an instruction can have like multiple registers. So this fine grained ASLR can be applicable to randomize the basic blocks level, instruction level or even in register level. So as we increase the granularity of this uh, uh, fine grained ASLR, the, uh, we also see a increased performance overhead but at the same time better security another thing is when we randomize these functions or basic blocks uh, or uh, the instruction we need to track those uh, function order or basic blocks order because uh, the applications or programs need to be functionally correct so in order to do that the the writer of, of those fine grained address space uh, layout randomization tools must uh, use some other lookup table like they can uh, store the order of the basic blocks or order of the instruction in some table so whenever the function get executed they can look uh, into the table to get the order and can execute based on that order so there is an additional time needed to look up those tables so that that is why we see increased performance overhead okay so what are the good things and the bad things of uh, fine-grained address space layout randomization so the good thing is uh, this uh, fine-grained ASLR can prevent all the traditional uh, return-oriented programming attacks and the leakage of a single gadget cannot lead attackers to find all gadgets so basically the this is the simple leak that we assume in our exploit would, would not be helpful because that sing single leak will not reveal all the other gadgets that needed in this case and the bad thing is it increased the performance overhead or runtime overhead and also have as like compatibility issues and many of the fine-grained 
uh, ASLR solutions require source code, but in practice, many of the applications have like closed source. So those in, in those cases, this kind of solution cannot be applicable. So here I have listed some of these fine-grained ASLR tools. You can visit this website. You can download the, the tools. You can run on your machine to see and play with it. So do the fine-grained ASLR defenses solve the memory disclosure problems? So the answer is no, because there are some advanced techniques like ZIT ROP or just-in-time return-oriented programming, which can essentially use a single leak and can essentially reveal all the uh, address space of an application. So we have some paper recently published where we use this uh, advanced attack technique. You can uh, look into this paper, you can read it if you are interested. So why the these leakage resilient defenses are important? As I repeatedly said, one of the prime requirement for any code reuse attack or any ROP based attack is the information leak or code pointer leak. So code pointer leak is basically the address. So in order to conduct these attacks, we need this information leak. Otherwise, the attack is not possible. So that's why this leak is a resilient defenses play an important role. So we have seen leakage resilient solution in different categories like fine-grained ASLR, fine-grained re-randomization, uh, memory protection category, code pointer in integrity category, and data pointer integrity category. And all the tools in this bracket are uh, that solution tools in these categories. For example, self-rando for fine-grained ASLR, TA, TASR is, is under this fine-grained re-randomization category memory protection category we have uh, execute only memory execute and read etc so you can like look into these uh, tools if you are interested let's discuss the control flow integrity or cfi defense so as i said before uh, control flow integrity or cfi is an orthogonal defense mechanism which can protect all kinds of control oriented attacks so this it is orthogonal to all the exist all the other defenses that we have discussed so far like the aslr the nx the stack canary and the railroad etc so the cfi aims to provide a strong protection against all control oriented attacks and it basically does it by detecting all the deviation from the normal flow of a flow of a program so how does cfi really does that so let's uh, go through uh, with an example so in the left hand side you can see we have a code snippet where we have a function less than or lt we have a, another function greater than or greater than or zt we also have a function called sort2 which is called another function which is sort another two function calls to sort function we didn't show the sort implementation of sort function in this uh, area due to the space limitation but that's fine if we just uh, talk about only the sort function not the actual implementation but one thing i just need to point out here that this sort function takes in the input a array the length and a function pointer so this is basically in this case it's pointing to this lt function and for the second sort it pointing to the gt function now if we would like to see the normal flow of this program let's see the program starts from sort 2 so if it start from sort 2 then inside this sort 2 function we have a sort function call which is this it's called to it's calling to the sort sort function then inside this sort function as I pointed out there is a function pointer so at some point this inside this sort function it will call this LT function now for the first sort fun 
short call we know that this is point this lt is pointing to this lt function so in this case this function pointer will point to this lt function so then inside this lt function it executes this function body and then it returns so it returns to here then it, it executes the rest of its function body and returns to here then again the second sort call it call to this sort method and then again call to this function pointer now we know that this second call is that this function pointer is pointing to this gt function so this function call would be now calling this gt function it will also execute all uh, its function body and return to here and again it will execute the rest of its function body and it will return to here and then it will execute its rest of the function body and return to some other location that we didn't show in here in this particular setup now this is the normal flow of this program now how cfi uh, ensures that there is no uh, no deviation from this normal flow so that the way CF, cfi ensures that is it adds some leveling to this program so basically whenever cfi see a function call for example this is a call to sort function whenever it sees a function call it add it marks a location with a level for example in this case it marks the location just after the function call as level id 1 and passes this id information of id on with this function call so that means when it calls this sort function it has this id on information now inside this sort function we are, it also sees another function call so it level the next location with id2 and passes this id2 information with this function call now we know that from our previous example this function like this function pointer is pointing to the lt function so the execution goes to this lt function now this lt function execute its function body and after executing the function body it will return now whenever it return it takes the id2 which is passed with this call so it will check id2 and this level if it's returned to this location so if they match that means this return is valid then it will execute rest of the function body of this sort method and then it will return and again from here we passed id on to this sort function so it will mass this id on to this level id on this id on if this return is returning to here so if it returns to here and if both ids are masked then this is also a valid return similarly the second sort call it will also label this location with id on and passes that id information to this sort function now since it's under the same sort to function it will not create a new id here it will just reuse the already created id here since it is inside this sort to function it, whenever it in, it goes into a new function then it adds a new id but for this case since it's already in this sort to function it will just reuse the previously created id here so now it will pass this id on to the sort function here again now this inside the sort function it will again level this as id2 it's already been uh, leveled in in from the previous execution so this id2 is passed with this function call now we know this function pointer is pointing to this greater than function so it will the execution will go through this greater than function its rest of the function body will be executed here and when it returns it check this id2 and this id2 if it, if this return is returning to here if it does that that means it's a uh, like valid return again the after executing the rest of the function body it will return from 
here to here and we will check that the, if this id on and if this id on are masked if they masked that means this is a valid reader it will execute its rest of the uh, function body and returning to its intended location now let's say this sort to of function returns to here now this id 0 and this id 2 is not same that so that it that means this return didn't return to its intended location uh, so that's the way the cfi can detect the abnormal flow or the deviation from the normal flow now one thing you have noticed that we need a number of ids to ensure this uh, uh, normal behavior now for this particular setup we had like uh, two functions two nested function calls this sort to call sort then this sort call less than or greater than but if this nested function calls like getting bigger and bigger and complex then the number of id requirements will be uh, larger so based on the number of id uses uh, we called the cfi schemes as like on id cfi or two id cfi so basically if we use a single id in a cfi scheme that called on id cfi for example in this case we leveled all the location with just a single id that is still a cfi scheme because it can still uh, can ensure some of the normal behavior but there are some cases for example uh, in this case this uh, return from here to here is not valid but since both the ids are same this on id cfi cannot detect this deviation so that's the limitation of this on id cfi scheme and this is the example we have shown in the previous slide for for this particular setup the two id cfi is sufficient for ensuring the normal behavior or detecting any deviation and we can just create like 3 id cfi 4 id cfi so the more more the ids in the control flow graph we use the more precise the leveling would be and the more deviation we can cut however the more uses of these ids will impact the performance like uh, then we need to check all of these IDs in runtime so that will cause like performance overhead and runtime overhead so there are some key questions that one needs to answer before implementing any CFI scheme so first of all it's related to the number of ID they would like to use because more users of more IDs increase the preciseness but at the same time causes performance pen penalty and the second question is how to resolve all indirect control flow transfer so this is basically related to like whenever you are trying to build up the normal flow of the program you need to construct the control flow graph of that program but on challenge of constructing con control flow graph statically is to resolve all the indirect control flow transfer because those kind of transfer can have different values depending upon what the code before those kind of control flow transfer executes so based on those execution the value would be different like for on case like for in, in the previous slides we see the function pointer which pointing to the less than or greater than function so you, you cannot statically know uh, what value would be those function pointer what value the function pointer would get in runtime so statically resolving this indirect control flow transfer is a difficult task so the next thing is how to enforce uh, the if how to enforce efficient id checking mechanism so the more ids we use the more uh, like uh, time we need to check the ids like when we when a function return we need to check the id so the more ids we use the more uh, runtime over it it causes so that needs to be balanced so 
that's also related to the number on question and the last thing is how to solve the compatibility or interval operability issues between cfi and non-cfi binaries so basically if you have a binary that is cfi enabled and another binary that is not cfi enabled then how do you operate between this cfi and non-cfi binaries and how do you, how do you solve the compatibility issues so these four are the key questions to implement any cfi solution okay so in this lecture i have covered like some existing attack techniques and uh, defenses that the modern operating system has and uh, I also discuss about the classes of code reuse attacks and particularly the ROP, ROP based attacks uh, I also showed you an example through a demonstration of ROP based exploit then I discussed about the coarse grained and fine grained ACLR and also the importance of leakage resilient solutions also discuss about uh, the CFI schemes and also some key questions that on should remember or answer before implementing any CFI solution so thank you for watching this lecture and if you have any questions or suggestion please feel free to post it on canvas or Piazza and thank you again